Thank you. Thank you, Cedric. Well, it's a pleasure for us to be back, Marie Pia and Lean Institute France. One more time, thank you for bringing us all together and having some really outstanding uh, points of view. Um, as many of you know who have heard us speak before here or elsewhere, we have spent, we added it up now over three decades uh, that we have been in some way trying to bring technology to the mainstream business in ways to deliver value and continuously improve. It's been quite a journey. We also know that we are the last thing between you and a glass of French wine. So we'll try to be brief, not too brief. We'll try to have fun and uh, hopefully learn something along the way. So, Karen. I need to click you the button. Click, yes. See, this is our experiment in collaboration, <laughs> which... Yeah, I, if I were standing next to him, I could poke him with, poke the, with the elbow yes. a little bit. But uh, So if you've uh, seen us talk over any time over the last probably 10 years, you've seen this slide, and it's something we believe in very much that the only sustainable competitive advantage is the ability to learn faster than the competition. It's not about being a lean organization or an agile organization or this organization or that organization. We believe it is about learning and being able to act rapidly and efficiently on that learning. So today we're gonna to talk to you about what is commonly called an enterprise agile transformation or a digital transformation. And what we see is some of the common tripping hazards with that. We've been involved over the past several years with a number of very large scale enterprise agile transformations, sometimes often, working alongside very big consulting agencies. And we don't bring a particular methodology. We think there's so many out there that can work well. We're there to help the organization learn how to learn. So with this agnostic method, we try to keep an open mind and we look, oh, I'm speaking to your slide. Here. <laughs> Again, it needed the, the elbow across the way. Yeah. So just to give you a little roadmap, we're gonna start talking about the problems that we see, the common pitfalls that we see, and then the second part, we're gonna be focusing on countermeasures. So one hazard that we see uh, we like the Don Quixote image because jousting at windmills, typically when people see this image, they think either um, futile uh, battles with en imaginary enemies or some sort of ideological battle that really doesn't amount to much. And that's really what we're seeing a lot out there. There are so many communities of practice out there. Of course, there's Lean, there's Agile, there's Scrum, there's DevOps, there's XP, there's Analytics. There's um, governance, legal, finance. These are all areas of practice, communities of practice, very smart people. And they have the opportunity to work together in a flow method towards the uh, outcomes of the enterprise and the customer. But if they stay in their own provincial castles, they suboptimize. And we see that a lot. And that's part of the reason we emphasize, even though we're at a lean conference, we emphasize agnostic. And you'll understand more later what we, what we mean by that. Another thing that we see, and more common now than ever, as this VUCA thing speeds up, is a focus on the new stuff, the shiny stuff, the, the bright uh, toys, and insufficient uh, focus on operational excellence. And we heard that, a perfect example of that, uh, Kenneth from BMP Paribas yesterday, where the non-sexy, inner workings of the bank that are necessary to make payments happen. Uh, not very sexy, but very much rigorous operational excellence. And without ops, there isn't DevOps. And so we really find a need uh, in this day and age where everybody is throwing a lot of money and effort and attention at Agile and Scrum and DevOps, we've got to put more attention on this. So this is a history lesson from seven years ago with Run, Grow, Transform. And if you look at this slide, things haven't really changed. Still, many organizations are trapped at around 60 to 70% BAU expenditures, still trying to achieve bare minimums of reliability, resiliency, fault tolerance. And again, um, it's necessary in the overall flow from dev and ops to deliver. And 
We like to think about the dev and the ops as the yin and the yang. They really do balance each other. Development is doing new stuff. It's, it's going where you've never gone before. It's emergent learning. But you have to deliver with high quality. You have to make that learning loop where you're learning what failed and hopefully preventing that failure, or at least preventing that failure from reaching the customer like we learned from BNP Paribas yesterday. But we need to understand the flow of it. We need to understand the mechanics of it. On the other side, operations is really more about consistency, back to the old quality methods, but they really depend on each other. And I think the most important message that we need to make is that DevOps, it's not just a technology thing. The necessary flow of new ideas into production is not a DevOps thing from a few years ago. It's a lean thing, it's a Toyota thing that goes back decades, 40 or 50 years. It just, it's a different context when applied in a technology environment. Um, so remember the yin and the yang and the balance of these two. So another big obstacle that we frequently run into is solving problems. Too often we see leadership say, hey, go solve problems. Uh, have at it. And what they don't do is invest in the organization and developing the capability to solve those problems effectively. So what we often see is a lot of symptom solving. We see a lot of shifting the problem. Hey, this is the part of the elephant that we see, and so we've solved the problem. And when they're able to see the larger view, they say, oh, all we did was shift it elsewhere. So what we like to, uh, to think about, we'll be talking more about this in, in the, the coming slides, but keep in mind that if you don't have the capability to really design a good experiment and to understand what is a statistic, statistically valid sample to validate your hypothesis, then you really are, uh, are just solving symptoms. And borrowing something from the last speaker, Pam, I think we all think we're better problem solvers than we really are. And if we could all set ourselves a goal to really step back and look at our methods, and we have a lot of data, whether that data is any good and whether it's the right data or not, I think we can all become better problem solvers, and it requires a method. So here's another big one. Not seeing the whole across the whole enterprise. And what do we mean by that? Well, there is a lot of emphasis these days in the agile transformation and digital transformation on the customer experience, the customer journey. And that's really where it lies. I mean, that's the first lean principle that goes back 20 odd years. But by focusing on the customer journey and losing sight that there are so many things that have to happen inside the company to deliver that customer experience, and the moment you introduce this notion of omnichannel, where it's not one value stream, but several parallel value streams that need to be synchronized together so that the customer has a seamless experience, not knowing what's going on behind the scene, behind the Oz-like curtain. And in an organization that's siloed, functionally siloed, omnichannel is a very difficult experience, not a challenge, not just a technical challenge of integration, but a mindset challenge, a leadership challenge, a management challenge. So helping everyone in the organization in the move to digital, in the move to agile, whatever you call the move you're making, to see the whole and know that, as Davi pointed out earlier, it really starts with culture. So another obstacle we see is the leadership mindset. Um, there is tremendous pressure, of course, for the financial goals that the organization sets for us, what the market expects of us, and often leadership says, let's just do this quickly. Um, and I'm reminded of the old adage that is one of the key concepts of lean is to slow down to speed up. And that is a very significant obstacle that we see is we need to slow down and build elements into our transformation to be successful. But we'll talk more about that later as well in the countermeasures. Learning how to learn. Um, too often we, we approach, as Davi mentioned, we come in with a checklist, with a methodology for transformation. 
and it is an implementation. It is not a deep understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. And when we don't have that, we're stuck in shoe. We can't move to adapting practices or rituals or the way we communicate and collaborate because we're stuck in the checklist mentality. This is another big risk that we see in transformations is, is it's just paint by numbers. So we suspect some, if not all of these, are familiar to many of you. What we want to do now is switch gears and now that we've discussed some of the key problems, some of the key tripping hazards that we see in large transformations, let's put our lean thinking hats on and let's talk about countermeasures. What can we do? How do we experiment? So, first of all, the notion of jousting at windmills, the notion of bringing communities together. Inside this word cloud are the most popular, generally technology-oriented communities, but outside are these other communities that happen to have something to do with actually running the enterprise and delivering things to customers. And they have just as many skills and experience and education and certification and dogma as the folks inside the cloud. The old saying, my karma ran over your dogma, remind anyone of anything. Um, the notion, though, is if we're really going to create flow, we're going to create end-to-end -end enterprise flow in the service of the customer, we all need to bring to the table what we, it is we have value to contribute and leave our baggage at the door. And like Peter Senge once said, the problem isn't that we have mental models. We all have mental models. The problem is if we don't recognize that we have a mental model. And so we all need to bring our best selves to the table Really look at what we bring of value, look at what we need to leave behind, and bring that all together. And so how we do that is with principles. Now, principles are that which guide us when there aren't rules. And in the age of VUCA, there, there aren't many rules anymore. And we like to think back to the five original lean principles that Jim Womack and Dan Jones introduced just a little over 20 years ago. And they really are timeless, but there are some new principles, some that you could say are, are shared by the Agile folks, the Agile Manifesto, that, that need to play too because they had a different perspective of things. Several years ago, I had the distinct privilege of um, introducing Jeff Sutherland who is one of the co-creators of Scrum, to John Shook, who was until recently the CEO of the Lean Enterprise Institute. And the funny thing was, both Jeff and John were headquartered in Boston, yet they had never met each other. They had never been to see each other. And that's kind of a metaphor for the whole Lean Agile divide, because they're twin sons of different mothers. They are, they're the same in a way, because they share the same principles yet they are somehow different by perspectives. And simply bringing them together in a room together to tell stories, we realize it's no surprise, uh -huh, the principles we share, the beliefs that we hold true to are essentially the same and we have a lot to learn from each other. And I think the same can be said for anyone within these various communities. And that's the coming together that we need and it takes a lot of trust to do that. So in doing that, we can all focus on what the Lean Principles and the Agile folks say is critically important, which is focus on the customer. Lean Principle number one, customer value. And the manifestation of this in the Agile world, like we talked about earlier, is this notion of a customer journey. What is the customer experience? So what is it, customer value or customer journey? experience. Well, actually, it's both. Because think back, have any of you had an experience with a, a, a provider of insurance or whatever it is, and you get good value, but the customer experience stinks. It's awful. And the moment somebody else comes along with the same value, but a better experience, you're going to switch very quickly if the switching costs are low. So you need to, you need to look at both. You need to look at value, obviously, and experience. You can get away with one or and not the other, but not for long because you're leaving a flank exposed for competition. But this isn't the only story. The second principle is the optimal flow of value and knowledge. 
And this takes us back to value stream mapping. Any of you lean practitioners out there have probably done more than your share of value stream mapping, and we're celebrating about the 20th year of value stream mapping. It feels like it's been around forever, but it's only been a couple of decades. And any of you that have seen the traditional method of value stream mapping, know that it's fairly linear. It grew up in a physical movement environment of the factory. Now, since then, it's been applied in all areas, healthcare, finance, you name it. But the traditional linear value stream model no longer applies in the digital age of omnichannel. And so we feel that a new model is necessary, and we've been working on this. We've pioneered this for the last few years. It really started, this method started seven years back with Run, Grow, Transform, and it's evolved quite a bit since. It needs to focus on the customer journey. But what has to happen in the background are all of the various value streams and supporting processes by the different functions of the organization, including the shared services of IT and finance and legal and all of those, have to come together in what we call a multidimensional value stream map. So that if the customer has an experience that's not very good, some of us might call that a steel thread. Some of us might call that a line of sight. But if all the teams that are contributing to that experience aren't working well together, the customer feels it. Now in the traditional value stream mode, um, you look at gaps and handoffs and errors and defects going horizontally, but in this model you also have gaps and defects and errors and delays happening vertically. That's why we call it multidimensional. How else can you take the value stream mapping benefits we've all learned to apply and treat them in an omnichannel environment. But there's one thing that's still missing, the data sources, okay? There's a lot of data out there and it's growing every day. And what data we choose and how we choose to look at that particular problem, we'll, get, we'll come back to that in a moment. So the third principle is the culture of continuous improvement. Um, Dan called this striving, Dan and Jim call this striving for perfection. But it starts, we believe, with leadership creating conditions in which this can occur. Um, it is one thing to say, hey teams, go out and solve problems, but it's another to invest, to slow down, to go fast, to invest in our teams being able to understand how to solve problems, how to spot problems, having time in their day to have slack, to not be have a whip that will consume 100% of their time, but an understanding that their whip includes time to solve problems, to improve. And the skills, the capability to be able to analyze, to discover root causes, to be able to design a good hypothesis, to understand the analytics, that go into designing those experiments that are valid, that give us the statistical validity to be able to conduct a really small sample, but have it be valid to represent the population that we are after. So this is the actual act of engaging in that problem solving and decision making. So if we have leadership creating the conditions for that to happen, we also have, the, have to have the culture and the practice and actually do it. We have to make this part of our daily experience, capturing those problems, visualizing our flow so we can see where those problems occur, being able to prioritize what is most important based on on our Hoshin or OKR or whatever prioritization system that our enterprise uses, being able to bring the right people together, to be able to bring different perspectives, not just this team, but other people who can bring something, a richer view of this, different experiences, different thoughts, different ideas about potential countermeasures, and collectively design good experiments and conduct them quickly and efficiently. And we need to set a culture across the organization of making decisions based on hard data. Now, problem solving is for lean thinkers and for agilists as well, for everyone, should be the air that we breathe. It should be um, the way we approach every situation every day. And yesterday, uh, we heard Pierre Masai, the CIO of Toyota, 
Emiya talk to us about the ontology of Toyota, the, the topology, if you will, of the various practices and how they fit together. He talked about PDCA, he talked about Kaizen, he talked about Hoshin. And in our experience in the market today, there is an awful lot of excitement, enthusiasm, and energy around this thing called OKRs. I'd like to see a show of hands, how many of you have run into OKRs in practice, okay? Now, OKRs goes back to Andy Grove at Intel, and then it was introduced uh, by John Doerr at uh, Kleiner Perkins to uh, Google, and Google claims that it's one of the keys to their success. There's a good book about it, and OKRs stand for Objectives and Key Results. So leadership sets objectives at the strategy level, and down one level in the organization there are key results that need to be achieved to uh, support that strategy, okay? And OKRs cascade downward in the organization. So, sounds like Hoshin so far, right? There's one problem in all the literature and everything that we've seen about the practice of OKRs, the missing piece that is not an essential piece in OKR, but it is the essential part of Hoshin, is this notion of catchball and problem solving. In Hoshin, strategy is set by leadership. They're the ones that it's their job to set the vision and look out into the future and say, these are the major initiatives we need to make progress on. And down in the organization, each one of you at a lower level of your organization, try to figure out what it is you need to do to move the needle forward in that direction. So far, so good. But if it's simply command and control, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, I don't care how you do it, if you achieve those numbers, I'll reward you, and if you don't achieve those numbers, I'll punish you. That's MBO, management by objectives. That's just command and control all over again. Not saying that that's how we always see OKRs do, done, but if you take an old culture and you put OKRs over the top of it and you think you're going to change the leadership mindset, about how you're going to learn your way to improving, and you're not going to get there without the catchball piece, which is to say, at whatever level of the organization I am, I'm handing down to a function or to a value stream lead, here's where we think you should be. Now, what are you going to do about it? What, what do you think are the obstacles? What are your hypotheses? What can you do in the next week, month, quarter? to move towards that. And you come back to me periodically, and at the end of the quarter, we'll do a review because the Hoshin is on a quarterly cycle, just like the OKR QBR cycle. But if you come back and you say, well, you know, we didn't quite hit the target, but we learned some things that will help us get better at hitting our targets next quarter. Sounds like a sprint planning now, right? It's the same iterative learning. But at the same time, we learned something about the strategic context that you as a senior leader might want to know about. There's learning going on. It's the PDCA loop. And that's what adaptive learning is all about. And that's the magic of Hoshin. You heard Pierre talk about it yesterday. You heard Pierre talk about the mindset of as a leader, if I'm not looking for problems and solving problems, I'm not moving the organization forward. I'm moving the organization backwards. So that is an example of problem solving in the context of the leadership mindset that needs to change for a true learning organization to emerge. Oh, I'm sorry, this is me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about data integrity and actionability. Sometimes when we present this, we have a slide that looks at the various dimensions of data integrity, but it's all about quality, accessibility, usability. But what does it really mean? In the larger organizations, there are literally thousands of data sources. And often half of those are known only to a few people. So data governance, of course, from a command and control perspective is very important, especially with the concerns of privacy, security, and all that these days. It is not a small thing. But at the same point, when you think about this, when we really want to use that data to solve problems at the enterprise, the data can't be owned by someone in a fortified castle. We need to find a way to make sure that every team or groups of teams has knowledge of and access to those data sources 
that are useful to them to solve that particular problem. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people think that data, you know, a fact table, data is truth, okay? It's kind of hard, you know, philosophy, you could argue data is truth. But I would like to say that data, truth is contextual. You can take the same data set, and if you're a senior leader or a team leader or a customer service organization, you might look at the same data, but you're going to inquire. You're going to ask it different questions. You're going to interpret that data differently. So data isn't a universal truth, but it has to be representative of the facts and evidence of the situation, and that's the tough part. But really, to help teams use the data, separate the wheat from the chaff to make good decisions, they have to ask themselves the classic lean question, lean thinkers question, which is, what is the problem we're trying to solve and what do we need to know about it that we don't know now? And that will lead you down the path of saying which of this sea of data that we have accessible to us is helpful and which of it is just noise. So the mindset of innovation, um, we heard Mark from uh, Amazon Web Services yesterday tell us an interesting story of Napoleon and the Russian, um, the, the Russian battle. We learned about the painful governance and rules of decision-making rules. Um, I think another leadership mindset that we need to all recognize can hold an otherwise well-intended digital, agile, or otherwise transformation back are the leadership mindsets around risk. The notion that has emerged over years, if we build enough rules, if we build enough stage gates, if we build enough approvals and sign-offs, we can ensure a quality outcome. But then we learned with Mark's story yesterday that things are happening way too fast on the battlefield these days, and we can't do that anymore. So, in, but this notion of risk control through command and control is still stuck in the minds of many communities, especially within large organizations that report to shareholders and board of directors and Wall Street and regulators and compliance folks and security folks. And we need to make sure the integrity, as Mark pointed out, the purpose of these controls is served while not getting in the way of agility because the only response to truly adapting to changing threats on a daily basis, changing threats and opportunities is the agility and that has to happen at the front line and that is all about PDCA. Back to problem solving. What's the problem we're trying to solve? What's the context? What's our hypothesis? How do we design the right experiments? How do we iterate as quickly as we possibly can? If, if you can do a good experiment in two weeks, how about a great little MVP in two days to prove the core value hypothesis that's telling you, is this the right problem to solve or not? Is it solvable or do we need to pivot and move elsewhere? And that is the real emphasis on how to manage risk and how to succeed in a VUCA environment. Um, but expect some pushback. You can expect a lot of pushback, but this in, institutionalized risk management mindset has been around for many generations and old, ha old habits do not die easily. Before we move on, I'll just add to that that one of the ways that you address that lack of, if you will call it trust, of leadership saying we need all of these stage gates, we need all of these rules in place, is that you build capability into your teams to be able to really make good decisions. And that takes time and that takes investment. But over time, if you can demonstrate through data, through results, that we are making the right decisions, we're making them with good resource stewardship, we're doing the right things, those stage gates should collapse for you. So finally, talking about what we believe is the seventh principle is generative leadership. We see a lot out there on servant leadership. And to serve is to enable your teams to support them to do the work. We believe there is a significant difference between a servant leader and a generative leader. And you saw this in, uh, in Pierre's presentation talking about the, the foundations of, of lean 
We build products, we also build people. Generative leadership is about growing your people to help them to develop, to develop individually, develop within the team and develop within the organization. And it's a subtle but important difference. We challenge them, we give them opportunities to grow, we work with them, we support them, we help them stretch. And ultimately, transformation isn't about just changing the structure of the organization or the practices that we engage in. It is about coming together as people throughout the organization, the front lines, the management, the leadership, learning together, changing the way they think, changing the way they engage to learn together, to improve and grow. And any of you who have been following Lean, reading about Lean for years, you've heard the phrase respect for people. And there's a lot of different opinions, perspectives on what that means. But through experience, we've learned that respect for people, first of all, you do need to respect them. You need to treat them well. You need to treat them kindly and compassionately. But respect for people in this context we're talking about here, and this goes deeply into the Toyota culture, is you challenge them. People want to grow. People want to learn. People want to um, feel pride, not just in their own accomplishments, but in their team's accomplishment. And so respect for people isn't just being nice to them. It's sometimes helping them, Pam, to your point, helping them to strive for a goal beyond what they think they can even reach. You need to give them a safety net so if they fail, they don't hurt themselves or the company or other members of their team. But at the same time, if you help them strive for this purpose and help them share it within their team and across the company, they grow too. Everybody grows because after all, they're the next generation of leaders and it's your responsibility to bring them up too. So respect for people is part of the whole generative process and that is the mindset we're looking for. And I think we're done. <laughs>